You may be seated. Gemar Chatima Tova, everyone. My rabbinical school sent me to Siberia, which is why you should never raise your hand when you didn't actually hear what they were saying. <laughs> in 2018, I helped officiate a joint B'nai Mitzvah in Tomsk through a program with the Joint Distribution Committee. It brought together an intergenerational cohort of Jews from the former Soviet Union whose Jewish identities were suppressed during a brutal history of pogroms and communist regimes of Lenin and Stalin. Russian participants hopped on planes, trains, and automobiles so that they could come together for a week of intensive Jewish learning, culminating in a B'nai Mitzvah ceremony on Shabbat. One of my beloved rabbis and teachers, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, Zichrono Lebracha, may his memory be a blessing, once said about this program that these are Jews plucked from the ashes of history. They had truly gone through the crucible, either themselves, their parents, their grandparents, and emerged on the other side, resolved to reclaim an identity so embedded in their souls it could not be extracted, eradicated, or forgotten. They wanted to stand in front of the Torah, before God and their community and declare in the face of everyone and anything that ever tried to stop them, I'm a Jew. This is my people. This is who I am. There is no question that they were teacher and I was student. But to the extent that I was there to teach Judaics and help prepare them for their B'nai Mitzvah, you could not have asked for a more enthusiastic group of learners. One class, I brought my talis and tefillin for them to demonstrate how to wear them and, and what blessings to say. Of course, there's a language barrier whenever you have an English speaker trying to teach a room full of Russian speakers, Hebrew. <laughs> so everything was communicated with the help of translators, except for the moments that transcended language. Like before I could demonstrate how to wear a talis, a Russian woman in her 60s gently took it from my hands without saying a word. She draped it around her head, pressing the sides of her face against it like a blanket, and closed her eyes in her own private moment under the talit. I remember thinking to myself, that's how you wear a talis. But here's the story I want to tell you. Before the ceremony, they all had the opportunity to choose their Hebrew names. So I sat with them one by one, leaping through a giant binder of Hebrew names, guiding them along based on things they care about, until it was Timor's turn. Timor, a boy in his teens, walks in, and before I can even open up the binder, he says, Yaakov, I want to be called Yaakov. Okay, Yaakov, I said. Can I ask why? He tells me that when he was nine years old, he visited Yad Vashem, the famous Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. He remembers visiting the children's memorial, the dark hall, floating candles, and the images of all these bright, smiling Jewish children who were brutally murdered in the Shoah. As you make your way through, a voice over the loudspeaker recites their names and ages. Hannah Hershkovitz, seven. Esther Goldstein, 13. Yaakov Rudashevsky, nine. Timur tells me, Yaakov's name stood out to me because I was nine years old at the time, too. I'm 17 now, and he never got to be. I want to be called Yaakov. In our Torah reading for Yom Kippur, we read about Aaron, the high priest, gaining access to the Holy of Holies, Kodesh Kodeshim, the inner sanctum of the portable tabernacle in the wilderness. He alone can enter it, and only this one time of year, Yom Kippur, in order to make atonement on behalf of the entire people of Israel. But this ceremony raises an important question. How can one person, Aaron in this case, take on responsibility for an entire people? How can Aaron, as one individual, carry all the children of Israel on his shoulders? The answer can be found in the Talmudic phrase, kol Yisrael arevim zebezer. All of Israel are guarantors for one another. We're all responsible for each other. We are our brother and our sister's keeper. Like Aaron on Yom Kippur, we each carry the entire Jewish people on our shoulders. In 
fact, on Yom Kippur, Aaron would have worn the ephod, which is a linen garment with a decorative stone on each shoulder piece. And both stones had the names of six tribes inscribed onto them. So he very literally carried the people on his shoulders. When one of us is uplifted, we're all uplifted. And when one of us falls, we all fall. Somewhere in Siberia, the memory of a nine-year-old boy named Yaakov lives on through a young man he never even got the chance to meet. He didn't have to because their sacred bond transcends time and space. And the reason we know this story at all is because somewhere in America, a generous donor named Elaine Burke partnered with the JDC to fund a B'nai Mitzvah program on the other side of the globe. And a rabbinical student raised his hand because how can you pa pass up an opportunity like that? To be a Jew is to have immediate connection to and responsibility for total strangers who aren't strangers at all because kol Yisrael arevim zebezeh. On Shabbat, you may know that there's a prohibition against carrying objects between domains. So I can't carry a bowl of salad from my house, a private domain, out into the street, a public domain. And I can't carry it from the street into your house, another private domain, which makes Oneg Shabbat, celebrating, enjoying Shabbat, really hard, unless we build something called an Eruv. An Eruv is a legal device the rabbis invented through which my house, the street, and your house all become one domain often by literally putting up poles around a neighborhood and running a string through them, all of a sudden my house is now your house. And we can have Shabbos lunch together without violating laws against carrying because we're all in one shared domain. Why go through all that trouble, this concept of an Eruv, besides how much we love making things more difficult than they need to be? <laughs> Maybe it's to teach us to expand our limited definition of self to broaden the boundaries of our hearts to span the entire neighborhood. There is a string that connects my house to yours. We are tied and knotted together like the strings, fringes of a talit, like the one my Russian friend wrapped around her head and cried into. And we remind ourselves of this every day before the Shema when we gather the four corners of the talis and pray for the ingathering of Jews from around the four corners of the globe. The same word for opening our house to one another, the same word for expanding our narrow definition of self, that word, Eruv, is the same word from Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebezeh. We are Eruvim, guarantors for one another, responsible for each other, inextricably mixed, even if we've never mingled. The program that I went on is just one of the lasting legacies of the Soviet Jewry movement, the international human rights campaign that rallied to the support of Jews stuck in the oppressive Soviet Union. Refuseniks, Soviet Jews denied permission to emigrate out, primarily to Israel, were not met with silence or dispassionate resignation from Jews and synagogues around the world. We formed grassroots organizations, one major one being none other than the Cleveland Council on Soviet Antisemitism and cried out in a single voice, let my people go. Like Egypt before us, there was a mass exodus, over one million Jews from the USSR thanks to an international effort that emerged around the sincere belief that kol Yisrael arevim zebezeh. But unfortunately, that story isn't over yet. It doesn't end there because we are a year and a half into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has left behind a trail of devastation in its wake. An estimated 200,000 Jews live in Ukraine, most of whom are now fleeing for their lives. Playgrounds have been turned into battlefields. Once vibrant cities where people loved and laughed and dreamed have been reduced to heaps of rubble in the biggest war in Europe since World War II. Many of my Russian friends are escaping too fearing conscription and the ramifications of speaking out against the war. But there's hope, because kol Yisrael arevim zebezeh. We don't turn our back on family. Overseas, the Jewish Agency for Israel, Jaffe, and the Joint Distribution Committee, JDC, 
to name just a couple, are hard at work making a serious difference out in the front lines. As of July, Jaffe facilitated the immigration of almost 17,000 Ukrainian Jews and over 70,000 Russian Jews. The JDC prepared over 290,000 meals and distributed over 1.6 million tons of humanitarian aid. Together, both groups have housed over 35,000 refugees in their facilities. And we have a lot to be proud of locally as well. Last year, Cleveland raised $5.5 million towards the effort, and the Jewish Family Service Association worked with 30 Ukrainian families. We're also proud sister cities with St. Petersburg. Our own member, Erica Rudin Luria, president of the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, recently returned from a mission trip to Ukraine, showing brave support through perilous conditions. And another one of our members, Clementina Pozniak, was Hillel director of Krakow until the outbreak of the war propelled her into refugee relief work. Just before the war, she worked with young adults who would come to her and say, I just discovered this photo of my grandpa. He's got a long beard and he's wearing a funny hat. What do I do? <laughs> Thanks to her, many of, her, of their members attended the first ever Passover Seder they've ever experienced, reading from Haggadot translated into Polish and Ukrainian. This Yom Kippur, let's be like Aaron, stepping into the Holy of Holies. Let's enter into this new year, recognizing that we carry the names of the 12 tribes on our shoulders. Let's be more intentional about opening our hearts and our homes to each other because kol Yisrael arevim zebezeh. Let's treat each other not as strangers, acquaintances, or even friends, but as family as one another's personal responsibility. But while all of us can aspire to be like Aaron, I want to ask just one family, with the help of a team of volunteers, to actually step up and be Aaron. B'nai Ashurin wants to adopt a Ukrainian refugee family, a mother and 10-year-old daughter. We want to sponsor their resettlement here in partnership with Global Cleveland and the Jewish Federation. We want to bring them into our Eruv. This is a serious undertaking. Minimally speaking, volunteers would be signing up for a six-month commitment to oversee a smooth transition period. Responsibilities would include being an official point person to sign with INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, helping them find housing and co-signing their lease, teaching the mother to drive and helping her find a job. She's an interior designer and artist, but understands she'll likely have to work outside her field. Setting the daughter up with a school, helping them with groceries, helping them find a doctor, it's a lot. But what could be a holier pursuit? And of course, we'd be in this together. If you're interested in learning more, to be the official sponsor or to help build a team of volunteers, please find Rachel Schwartz, chair of our Chesed Committee, or myself. This Yom Kippur, you could be the one to step into the Holy of Holies. I want to end with one final thought, which brings us back to the two Yaakovs. We're about to recite Yisker, our memorial service. It was Timor's time at the Children's Memorial that inspired him in his own way to adopt the memory of a nine-year-old boy. Our Jewish communal responsibility isn't only to the living, but to the dead, to our departed loved ones whose eternal flames we help nourish and sustain through loving memory. There is a string of connection that doesn't just cross the ocean between the west and the east, but between heaven and earth. We transition now to Yisker, elevating the names of those who've carried us on their shoulders and those whom we forever carry in our hearts. <laughs>